Hello and welcome to this edition of Outlook Portion Special Series on the health harms of trans fats. I'm your host, Ramananda Sengupta, and our eminent list of panelists today are Dr. Naresh Trihan, world renowned cardiovascular and cardiothoracic surgeon, and chairman and managing director, Medanta Heart Institute, Dr. Ananya Avasti, assistant director, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Ms. Laurie Norbert from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition and the Sun Alliance. Thank you so very much for joining us today and I look forward to a really stimulating conversation on this. Let me start with you, Dr. Jahan. You know, uh, research has clearly shown that trans fatty acids raise the risk of cardiovascular disease and therefore death. What role can cardiologists and medical leaders like you play in helping India eliminate this from our food chain? You know, basically, it boils down to awareness. Now, if you look at it, there is no truth in advertising right now in India as much as it should be. So you're talking about incrementally, there is a recognition that what we call junk food or fast food or whatever food you like or sin food, they all utilize shortcuts. They will always utilize commercial optimization for themselves. So there are elements in these foods which on one hand will create, if you take that first bite, it will create a craving in you for the next bite. By way of taste, mm -hmm. by way of, of introducing the recipe that it stimulates the the right center in your brain that will keep making the craving worse. Okay, So it right. attacks, your, attacks your senses and your neurological recognition. Mm -hmm. That's their job. I mean, I, it's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to be able to sell their products. Now, if they were doing their products without hurting somebody, it's one thing. If there are ingredients in it which are actually health hazard, we need to make the public aware of those. And that's what you're talking about today. Right. So trans fats we know are, most common is the refrying of things. So when you use trans fats, which are mm -hmm. the heaviest fats actually, they are metabolized not so efficiently by the body. And the chances of the levels of lipid and, uh, uh, and the low density low density uh, 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 sort of elements of cholesterol and lipids, which have the highest risk to a human being, then can actually, you know what really happens, the small molecules actually can seep through the endothelial lining of, a, of an artery. If I, sh if I just told you that an artery is like a tube, it has m multiple layers, the innermost layer of cells is known as endothelium, which is protective. If the endothelial layer is not breached by whatever, by trauma, by, by fats, by whatever, you will, be, you will not develop heart disease. The mechanism is that the endothelium gets breached by either trauma or tobacco, by, by repeated constriction of arteries, or by high level of low density lipoproteins in your blood. Now those can seep through the membrane and starts collecting under the endothelium to form a plaque. And that's how heart disease starts or blockages start. So we want to make the public aware of what are the fats that are human friendly. It's not only which ones are human friendly, but in what quantity they are human friendly. Right. So that's the level of awareness at which we need to get to the general population so that they make the right choices. I mean, in spite of knowledge, if you want to make whatever choice, it's your choice. That's freedom of thought and, and action. But ultimately, it is our job, along with the media, because you see, when I can give a lecture and have 5,000 people listen to me over a three, four, five, five lectures, but Media has the multiplying power of your your delivery of this message is magnified many times over. Now, this is very interesting what's happened with 
this new normal where we are using video for communication, you can reach many, many more people without disturbing them by leaving their home and reaching a place to listen to you and all that stuff. So this is the new norm. This is the new norm which will help us to actually spread the message. Dr. Avasti, uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health has played an important role in highlighting the you know, in, uh, health impacts of TFA and food. Do you have a, any India-specific study? Right. So in terms of, uh, as you know, uh, Harvard School of Public Health has been instrumental in uh, leading the efforts to really translate uh, science into actionable agenda, into advocacy for elimination of trans fats in diets. Now, as far as the studies in India have been done, of course, Vanaspati has been identified as you know, a major source of uh, trans fats uh, for products that are sold in India. Uh, but even beyond that, uh, when we look at most of the fried food, most of the Indian fried food that we see on the streets or the snacks, those certainly have uh, a high trans fat uh, component. And uh, while in the US, if you see the trajectory, uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, it was Dr. Uh, Walter Willett who included, uh, you know, this um, angle to trans fats and really testing it out in the famous uh, nurses' health study. And there was uh, conclusive evidence to show how uh, this is, you know, responsible for severe risk to cardiovascular diseases. What India can learn uh, from such an example is that this study was published in 1993, and then it took you know, the Harvard School of Public Health did not stop there. It went on to really be working with advocacy um, experts in the US, with the government, with US FDA. And finally, in 2003, FDA declared that, you know, food products have to be labeled, uh, you know, with the amount of trans fats that they contain by 2006. And then finally, we see uh, that, in, uh, that at least as far as the US is concerned, uh, industrial use of trans fat has really been minimized to, you know, uh, to, to nil. So this is certainly an example where evidence was used to be translated into policy actions that can improve public health. So yes, as a learning example, uh, we, we do know the kinds of facts that are unhealthy, uh, which continue to be, you know, continue to remain universal. Uh, but, uh, as far as India context is concerned, I think evidence to show that uh, Vanaspati uh, has high amount of trans fat is pretty clear, but I think we need to be going beyond just the medium of fat or oils, but to be really looking at some sort of uh, demand generation or mass awareness uh, within people to not just focus on, you know, uh, packaged foods and their labels, but really try and understand that most of the uh, food that they're having in bakeries and confectioneries uh, do contain a high amount of trans fats. Uh, let, me, let me come to uh, Ms. Aubert. Ms. Aubert, while on the topic of safer food systems and health, heart health particularly, uh, industry has a big role to play. I think, uh, uh, again, I think uh, Dr. Trehan also mentioned that industry also, you know, has a role to play. What, what is your assessment of, you know, uh, industry's commitment to TFA elimination across the world? And, uh, do you have any specific insights on India? Um, so we've, we've been working globally um, in terms of, of trans fat elimination. Then we focused on some low and middle income countries. And what we're seeing is that um, you really have two worlds. You have a world of large companies. So for example, the International Food and Beverage Alliance uh, that gathers 12 of the biggest food manufacturers. They have committed to um, basically the WHO target of two gram uh, per 100 grams of, of um, fat and oils. And they've talk, they have achieved uh, already around 98.5% of this target across their overall food portfolio. Um, so we're seeing, um, and as mentioned by the, by the previous panelists, we're seeing good progress in high income countries and we're seeing large companies now becoming compliant. They've proven that it's um, economically doable to uh, replace or to basically achieve WHO targets. 
but at the same time, what we did is we looked at uh, low and middle income countries and we specifically did a project in Nigeria and Pakistan. And there it's a different pictures from the industry because you have a lot of SMEs and local companies that don't even know what Transpad is. So uh, we've been talking about awareness of consumers. That's one thing, but you do have food producers um, and especially small food producers that don't even know what Transpad is. Um, and so it is obviously very difficult to see progress when you don't have mandatory regulations in place in settings where companies are also unaware of the transpad issue. Um, so what we're seeing, and I think that's all that has been highlighted as well by the latest WHO report, um, looking at their initiative on, on transpad replacement called Replace, um, is that you need more regulations, you need more laboratory capacity to test the foods that is also produced by this, uh, the small suppliers, and you need to make sure when you engage the industry, you don't engage only the big players that have the resources to comply, that are working in heavily regulated environment, but you're looking at small companies, and that's also the case um, for India, obviously. You need to look at your oil and fat suppliers that also provide oil and fats to small bakeries, to um, over food, small food producers, and you need to look uh, at uh, the overall part of the industry to really see changes. Dr. Trehan, uh, since we do have you here today, I'd, I'd like to ask you a specific question because, you know, we've been doing this series on trans fats where we've been looking at the regulatory aspects, we've been looking at, you know, uh, how, how uh, bad it is. But honestly, I haven't yet got a full idea of how exactly does trans fat affect your heart? What does it do? What, what is the, I mean, how does it really impact your heart? See, the basic thing that happens with with the uh, fat, and that we call it lipids in the blood, is that there is a fraction of different density in the blood of lipids. Like the highest density lipoprotein we call, which we call HDL in short, is what we call the healthy cholesterol or the healthy fat. Okay. Then you have low density lipoprotein. Then you have very low de density. Now there's even very, very low density. That means the smaller the molecule, that's the density, the more dangerous it becomes. The reason, as I said earlier, it has the ability to seep through the inner la layer of the, that is the protective layer of the arteries between the cells, because it's like a matrix. So that matrix can be breached. It can be breached by some other factor or it sometimes if you get a higher concentration of small molecules, you can breach it anyway. Now, if that happens, the fat starts accumulating in the wall of the artery, and that is where the artery starts narrowing. And that is where the danger comes from, and that one day, the narrowing becomes enough that it restricts the flow of blood through the artery. So once that happened, if artery is still open, and say you have 80%, 90% blockage, when you ra raise the demand on the heart for, for activity, it needs more blood because it's like fuel of a car. So it behaves, where if not enough blood goes through, the oxygen is not reaching the muscle, the muscle will give you signals by way of chest pain, pressure, shortness of breath. These are the signals you will get that the heart is not getting enough blood. Ultimately, it's the enough oxygen. Much like a car engine, if you have the fuel pipe, which is partially blocked, you can start the car. It'll idle. It'll go on a slow speed. But the moment you step on the gas pedal, it'll start stuttering. It'll start stalling. That's exactly what happens to the heart. So when it is the danger of these molecules depositing inside the wall of the artery, which narrows it down, and one, God forbid, if it, the surface ruptures or, and a clot forms, that's when you get a heart attack. So from an angina is when it's still flowing a little bit, but heart attack is when it blocks completely. So those are the precipitating factors how fats do affect. Uh, but when, uh, if you refer to earlier conversation, you know, regulation of the components of uh, a food industry can only be available in organized sector and you can progressively define standards and enforce them 
India has such a large amount or number of street food vendors. I mean, we have the, I, you know, one of the countries where we have the maximum variety of food available. And it's like I said, that there are harmful effects. And, and if you look at, like uh, was mentioned, Vanaspati, basically solid fats are more atherogenic than liquid fats. Right. So that's the thing. Except there's enough evidence today that real 100% pure ghee, not vegetable oil hydrogenated, which is Vanaspati, but pure animal like cow's milk in, into asli ghee, two teaspoons of that per day are permitted and are healthy because they have enough antioxidants. So there's a lot of data and research and evidence that keeps coming up. So we, you need to in, actually inter, extrapolate it, interpolate it to see where it lands. Now, if you say, what is the harm? When we are saying no trans fat and people start banning food for their children, there's no harm for a child to have a pizza or a burger once a month or, you know, every 10 days, your little slice. There's no harm. But it becomes harmful when you get frozen by fear, ban something irrationally. It will hurt you if you're, if you're going, going having a burger every day. Yes, because there is a lot of junk in that food. But then you must balance it off. Then you look at our own Indian food, you know, all these samosas and pakoras and all these other stuff that we eat. No, there's no harm in eating one piece of pakora or two pieces of pakora, but there is harm in eating the whole plate of pakoras. Because these I are, and, and if you take it from the street, this is this oil is used for refrying. If you take, a, that's very harmful. That if you take oil and you use it once, it's one thing. But if you use it repeatedly to fry again and again, then it becomes more atherogenic. That's the whole harm. I loved your analogy of a car engine. I think with your permission, I'll steal it when I uh, do something else on the same subject one of these days. Uh, Dr. Ravasti, uh, one of the things that I think even Dr. Triyan was suggesting is that we uh, inculcate behavior change among the masses. Now, how difficult is that? Right. So let me start with this um, example that, um, I mean, and why to emphasize that why behavior change education for something as, you know, uh, minimizing the use of uh, or consumption of trans fat in your diet in India is particularly important because at the US, uh, you bring about regulations since most of the food producers fall in the organized sector. It's really very easy to, you know, have a law and then see its impact. Uh, but in cases like India, where uh, not even more, probably more than half of the sector, the food producing sector, does not fall within the organized sector, it then really falls back onto citizens in terms of being able to, you know, really understand and build support for minimizing trans fats. Now, there are a couple of things in terms of behavior change communication. Knowledge is only the beginning of it. Now, uh, you know, in urban cities, if you ask anybody, people probably have an inkling that, okay, trans fat is unhealthy. They don't know why, but yes, it is unhealthy. But they do not know, uh, you know, what food items that they eat on a daily basis do in fact have trans fats. So while the behavior change communication on packaged food and food labels has still had some impact in terms of knowledge and attitudes in the urban cities, but say about samosas, you know, samosas, bhaturas, these cakes, pastries, white breads. I mean, there is a whole list of food items where people do not even know that they contain uh, high amounts of trans fats and packaged food is just one part of the picture. Now, in terms of behavior change communication, it's not enough to know the kind of, uh, so it actually falls into a couple of categories. One is the kind of packaged food that you're buying. So food labeling, and you know, a mass media campaign to look for labels. And then of course, these are phantom fats. You have to look out for words like partially uh, you know, hydrogenated or um, vegetable shortening. These are some of the ways we be using uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, some of the ways to sort of hide uh, the taxonomy of trans fats itself, but that's not enough. 
when you go out to bakeries and confectioneries of course there has to be an effort to convene uh, these food producers to start putting food labels to a lot of confectionery product uh, that is out there but what about bakeries confectioneries that do not package their food products what about school canteens which you know uh, so for example patties patties are a typical example of a food product that's you know that was consumed by me when i was a school going child not knowing that this has you know a high amount of trans fat or maybe vanaspati was being used to produce something as lovable as a patty to a school going child like me so in fact like in in, in the new york um in 2006 uh, the the city did declare uh, you know a ban on or rather not a ban or really a regulation on limiting the use of trans fat in the food products that were being sold in school canteens so those kinds of uh, behavior change uh, i mean that kind of behavior change is only possible when you start looking at strategies to you know really engage the communities not just in terms of what they go ahead and buy in a market but what is it that they should be thinking of when they go to the bakeries and confectioneries and not just that when you go to a restaurant and hotel uh, there needs to be awareness i mean we have to build some public support wherein people start asking questions like what is the kind of you know medium of oil that you've used for the food that you're serving me so in fact in the us when it was such a organized sector when it has taken you know more than 20 25 years to bring about that change of course in india it will take longer so the problem with behavior change communications is that you cannot there is not an immediate impact that you can see but that's probably the only way uh, you know that you have to really fight this out that's i mean I, i suspect that's not going to happen anytime soon but it's an effort well worth taking i mean that's the uh so but uh, you're part of the sun movement which you know is a sort of a consortium of various stakeholders involved in nutrition how can such a consortium be sort of you know uh, created for better heart health or something like that how 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 would that work um yeah so the sun movement is this idea of that basically to tackle nutrition you need to have governments at the center so governments are the one making the choice of joining the sun movement but then what you have is that you have networks being set up um at country level representing businesses um like we do and then also civil society un agencies um, and donors um and the idea there is that you would work towards a nutrition strategy um and you will work um with all these stakeholders as much as possible to implement that strategy um and and i think a key learning there is that you you can look at behavior change you can work with consumers you can work also on regulations and that's a key point um i think the the us example is very interesting because we've seen how long it took actually but it's also because there were many years where there were discussions about voluntary regulations and you really saw a really steep change when they decided to put national mandatory regulations and that that's a key point so you need those national regulations you need the laboratory capacity behind it to make changes you need to get the industry on board so they are aware of the changes all parts of the industry you need civil society to do this advocacy and uh, and you need the donors behind to make sure especially for um, low income countries for the most vulnerable consumers you also see changes um and then when you have all these stakeholders in place then you can look at, at what is changing in terms of creating new concerns um for for example better heart health um i think there is also a need to probably um look at what is already in place and existing in tech time to build this type of multi stakeholder platforms especially to have them functioning at country level it's still something we're working on um so i i think it's probably a lot of question in terms of creating a lot of new concerns for specific health areas rather than working on what is already out there um and and there are ways to change what is out there for example if you look at the sun movement initially it focused a lot on undernutrition because it was looking at low and middle income countries um and i guess fairly soon we saw that you can't really look at malnutrition without that looking at dietary risks um and the the growing epidemic of overweight and obesity obesity and the consequences on health um and so it changed a bit its mandate to look at all these aspects of malnutrition and the link on health um so there's probably a lot of value in making sure that all dietary risks um are looked at um that you have also a lot more coordination between 
all stakeholders from the health, the nutrition sector, the agricultural sector, all of these players work towards common strategy. Um, it, it's the case for many countries, but if you look at the cost of health systems today, um, this is not manageable for most countries. Like this, the, the growth we're seeing, that's not doable. But um, one way to address that challenge is, is to invest into prevention and that goes towards better food systems um, and that will have an impact on better heart health. You've often said that, you know, India will own the Kisenka. What steps are, be, are being taken by the medical community, including you, to strengthen prevention? B, is food safety one of the things that you sort of, uh, uh, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't use the word preach, but it's something that you advocate? So there is a, you know, 360 degree attack on prevention of heart disease. And that has all the components, which part of it, which we talked about and part of which I'm going to talk, to talk about now. So the first thing first, the, to understand heart disease, you must also understand that there is a strong genetic propensity in heart disease as there is in diabetes. So we say, if one of your parents has heart disease, your chances of getting heart disease will double. And that means in Indian terms, because the average incidence of heart disease in India is about 8 to 10%. So if 8 to 10% of the population will get heart disease, if your parents have heart disease, then your, the chances will double. And then if you have high cholesterol and low density lipoproteins are high, and also you're smoking, also you have diabetes, you're cooked. So basically, we need to understand the different risk factors that contribute to heart disease. We need to understand that stress itself is a strong contributor to heart disease. So at every level, you need to know where you're at. So for, to make it convenient, we say know your genes, because you will know whether it is family history of diabetes or heart disease. Then you have to be on the alert much earlier in life than you would be if you do not have these two things in your family. So we say by the age of somewhere between 20 to 25 years of age, you should have a complete screening of your biochemical system and physical system to make sure that you don't have or you do have some risk factors they may, that may eventually lead to heart disease. So if, in other words, when we became doctors or when medicine started, it was started to treat the sick. Then, then the medical profession got a little smarter and said, why wait for people to get sick? Why not do early detection? So the early detection would mean that you would intervene early and maybe not require such drastic treatment. Then we said, if that's a helping, then why not go for prevention? So if we can identify the various risk factors for an individual for a given disease, and over here we're talking about heart disease, we can actually make a difference. So now we say we are into predictive medicine. If you want to control the, the progression of heart disease in an individual or in a country, you need to work at multiple levels. And the food chain that we are talking about is one of those levels. Second is the point, like I said, if you are cognizant of the genetic makeup and your, your uh, risk because of your genetic makeup will, will be the second step. Then we say, once we know which are the other components that may add to the risk factor, then we say, systematically how do we bring them under control or eliminate them so what can you eliminate you can eliminate use of tobacco you can control blood sugar you can control high blood pressure and you can control or at least ameliorate stress levels but you can't change your genes so genes will tell you your your risk and all added factors have to be adjusted According to that. So, I'm not one of those guys who propose that everybody should become total ascetic. You must enjoy life also. But that means that everything you do has to be in moderation, except tobacco and drugs. 
tobacco is also a drug basically because the rest of the things if you do use in the right proportion and that will include what you put into your body and how much you consume so that you don't become obese if your cholesterol levels are high and your lipid levels are high you must reduce your intake and you must exercise more to consume more so there is a balance you can find in your body there's no reason to live in utter fear and be paranoid about everything or every piece of food you put in your mouth and like i said earlier moderation you can have even street food sometimes maybe you know just a little bit won't hurt you knowing very well that there may be some trans fat in it but then if you say you you should not go into deprivation because then it it actually uh, invokes the craving and craving is over reaction there so always be in balance puritans might try to say certain things which you know which will then swing the pendulum in the other direction so try to keep it within a band knowing very well what are the things that you are exposed to you are consuming and what are the risk factors and in what proportion that's the way you you avoid heart disease because if you are stressed over it all day that by itself will make you give you heart disease so stop stressing knowledgeable intelligent eating and intelligent life moderately lived is the best you can do for yourself but be very active your muscle mass must be maintained no matter what age you are at your cardiovascular system must be exercised at least 5 times a week that means 45 minutes of brisk activity whether it's a walk bicycle running whatever you like to do but if you do these two three things that's the best you can do for yourself and then whatever the unanswered questions are there who runs the world i don't know okay i was keep what uh, work is uh, harvard india research center doing with the ministry of women and child development particularly in the field of nutrition and what are the public health implications of trans fats on the ncd epidemic in india so as the harvard school of public health india research center um being an academic center our role is really uh, in terms of uh, working with the ministry of women and child development is documenting promising practices from across the country on social and behavioral change communication and portion of here the work that we are doing says that it's very easy to you know devise interventions sitting in delhi or sitting in boston and then expect it uh, you know to be rolled out and then scaled up on the field uh, instead uh, coming from uh, you know the coming on the lines of implementation research and responsive feedback what we are doing is collecting practices that seem to be working on the ground you know these are practices like say uh, using uh, godbharai or annaprashan as a cultural platform to promote breastfeeding and complementary feeding uh in uh, by the anganwadi workers that could be one example another promising practice could be you know documenting the nutri gardens or the portion vatikas uh that various uh, um anganwadi centers are building uh, in their backyard so what uh, what we propose to do is document them and then test them out using responsive feedback uh, mechanism to see what are the kind of messages and what are the kind of platforms uh, that seem to work uh, as far as behavior change communication and nutrition is required and a big focus that we also have for this pro uh, project is really mapping the dietary diversity the crop diversity in the country what are some of those local and regional crops uh, that we do not know uh, might be much more nutritious uh, than any of the superfoods in the market so how about mapping these food crops but then also generating demand for healthy and nutritious homemade uh, um, you know recipes uh, which can improve the dietary diversity in the country so that's about the project itself now in terms of implications uh, of uh, trans fats on uh, non communicable diseases if you look at the data from india 
you know within non communicable diseases you know which are also known as chronic diseases cardiovascular diseases form nearly 30% of uh, you know the total ncds in india and it, it's interesting to note that uh, it was nearly 15% uh, you know in the early 90s so it's quite clear that cardiovascular diseases uh, have uh, you you know pretty much form the biggest chunk of uh, ncd um, uh, problem in india and there is there is a substantial in fact uh, there, there is hard evidence to show that uh, dietary diversity is one of the key overlapping risk factors for uh, cardiovascular diseases and that trans fats is uh, you know undoubtedly linked to increased risk for cardiovascular diseases hence trans fats really tie up into the biggest disease burden that india has which is that of cardiovascular diseases and if we look at the world uh, nearly 500000 uh, uh, people uh, die each year because of uh, you know the consumption of trans fat in their diets and if you look at india we know that nearly 30% uh, of the ncd problem is caused due to cardiovascular diseases with important linkages to trans fats i would say it's a silent uh, pandemic uh, ncd is really a silent pandemic and coming with the coming of covid 19 we've seen how comorbidities uh, linked to cardiovascular health can be a big can be a very big predictor for morbidity and mortality related to covid 19 so uh, i would really say that yes trans fat elimination or at least the minimization to less than 2% in your daily diet can go a long way in really addressing the biggest reason for uh, you know mortality in india which is cardiovascular diseases once again i'm looking at the clock behind ms robert i am just uh, trying to wrap this up very quickly ms robert my last question to you is that recently you know the w who announced that countries that eliminate trans fats will receive a certification you know what that really means and uh, how can industries be incentivized to commit to the thresholds like you know not just reducing trans fats but also to uh, let's say go in front of the package labeling and things like that um so yeah we've heard of uh, this w trade initiative but we haven't been working with them around the certification um program so we're looking forward as a way to basically make sure we can better support the visibility around transfer i think it links to what has been said throughout um this um this by all the panelists is that you need more awareness and that having certification having front of pack labeling is a way to create that and so i think there's a recognition increasingly that you need to make sure that if you are asking um companies a uh, formal and informal to make an effort on trans fat elimination if you're making asking governments um local or national to see how they can um better protect their consumers for trans fat bans or regulations um you need to work around the visibility so consumers know the benefit um local companies know what trans fat means but, and they get also more visibility when we are making investments um around the thresholds i think we we see all things that work a very definitely we need to create more awareness and once again not only at consumer level but across um the food value chain and all the stakeholders um the example of for example frying um civil times using the same oil to refry your food again and again and um, that's something we um we saw through the workshops we organized in Nigeria and Pakistan there was very little awareness and that's a simple message to communicate about not refrying the the oil and food um i think uh, as well one thing we haven't really tackled here is that there's probably a lot that can be done if you work with your oils and fat suppliers it is indeed very difficult in many countries to reach out to all these street vendors to all these small bakeries um to uh, consumers that are using that's not that's not that's not then as my petigi and all uh, at home and so if you tackle us and food suppliers and you have obviously less of them and you make sure they are selling um products that are compliance with TFA limits then you you are tackling a lot of issue already uh, and that's one entry point that probably needs to be more looked at in terms of setting thresholds um and that um can also um address the issue around labeling because as has is has been said throughout um the discussion 
not all food that is consumed, especially in low and middle income country, is packaged, is coming from the formal sector, um, has clear labeling. Um, you also have issues around um, consistent labelings from one region to another across country, from one country to another, um, and so on. So if you're making sure you're looking at your supply of oils and fat, you can probably address a lot of the issues. And then if you have more certifications and more awareness, um, you probably also make the case for front of pack labelling. I think what we're hearing um, from especially small companies with less resources is that even if they are investing to um, reduce or eliminate uh, the industrially produced trans fat in their products, if consumers are unaware of what trans fat is, we have companies telling us they made the effort, they removed that, but they're not even telling their consumers. They did that as a way to say, if we're exporting products or if regulations are coming up at national level, this way we're compliant. But because consumers are unaware, there is not even a point, even if you have a healthier product in telling them. So that's what we're seeing at country level. Um, so that's probably in terms of the labeling, you need to think about the overall environment, the country context to see how it is relevant or not. Great. I mean I have a whole set of questions in my hand and I'm sure, you know, I can see that there are apparently some 11 other participants who probably have questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time. Thank you so very much, three of you. Thank you, Dr. Trehan. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ravasti. Thank you, Ms. Robert, for, you know, joining us today. I look forward to having you again individually together once more. Thank you so very much and I look forward to having you all again. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great Thank week. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for all your knowledge. Bye.